When acetyl-CoA enters the tricarboxylic acid cycle, the carbons from acetyl-CoA are not going to get released as CO2 during the first turn of the cycle. Instead, it's going to take the second and the third cycles in order to actually be able to release that as CO2. To illustrate this, basically, imagine that you have oxaloacetate, and we have it here so that these are basically the carboxylic acids. When acetyl-CoA comes in, what happens is it comes in and it kind of adds on top. That happens in our citrate synthase step. Now, if we think about where the CO2s are gonna get lost, they're gonna get lost to the isocitrate dehydrogenase step, and they're gonna get lost to the alpha ketoglutarate dehydrogenase step. The first one, the isocitrate dehydrogenase, is going to remove the middle carbon. There are some other like rearrangement steps and things like that, but um, like isomerization, all that good stuff, but now we're just fo focusing on the carbon backbones. We think about losing this middle CO2, and then we focus on, we lose the bottom CO2. Those were both coming from our oxaloacetate. They were not coming from the acetyl-CoA. At this point, we kind of end up with this molecule of succinate. So again, I'm kind of like skipping over some rearrangements and things, but succinate is a symmetrical molecule. Basically what happens now is that this can flip over or not flip over, and either way, you can't you can't really tell it apart and so these are going these two are kind of going to be identical now and these two are going to be identical now so we can't tell which came from the acetyl coa or which came from the oxaloacetate but just for the purposes of being able to see what's going on we'll consider we'll just keep it in this orientation so we end up with having this um, succinate which gets transformed into oxaloacetate Note that here we had these oxidative decarboxylations where we lost CO2 when we had our oxidation step. But here, we go, when we go from malate to oxaloacetate, this is an oxidation, but it's not a decarboxylation. And similarly to when we had our succinate dehydrogenase step, that was an oxidation, but it wasn't a decarboxylation. The only CO2 that we lose are going to be in the first half of the cycle. The second half of the cycle is just to regenerate our oxaloacetate. So if we imagine that we've now regenerated our oxaloacetate, we still have the two, acetyl, um, the two carbons from acetyl-CoA, as well as two carbons from the oxaloacetate that were there already. In order to actually be able to remove those, uh, the ones from acetyl-CoA, we have to bring in another acetyl-CoA. When that comes in, well, now we lose the bottom carbon. We, um, sorry, the middle carbon, the bottom carbon, we shift things over. Remember, at this point, it's symmetrical, so we can imagine flipping it over if we want to, or we don't have to flip it over if we don't want to. I'm not going to flip it over just so it makes it easier to see what's going on. If another acetyl-CoA comes in, well, now we can lose this, we can lose this, and then we can lose this. And then finally, if we have another one come in, we can lose this, we can lose this, and we can lose this. So we see that finally we lost, another, we lost our acetyl-CoA, um, but it took bringing in another two acetyl-CoAs in order to actually kick those out. So the ones that we're kicking out, if we think about if we were to come from pyruvate instead of acetyl-CoA. Well, with acetyl-CoA, that's going to be two molecules, and pyruvate, we have three. If we think about our pyruvate dehydrogenase step, basically we're going to lose this position. So it's the first position of our pyruvate that we leave lose. And so then what's going to happen is that you basically would then have this so that this was your second and your third from pyruvate. However, when we're dealing with this, if we think about dealing starting with glucose, that was not going to correspond to the same numbering as with pyruvate because glucose, we had a six um, carbon molecule that we broke in to two three carbon molecules and both of those we were able to interconvert and therefore the numbering is going to get all scrambled. So if we think about our glucose and we think about taking it through glycolysis, what's going to happen is that we're going to, at this fructose 1,6-bisphosphate step, um, this is kind of the point between, before you break it in half by aldolase. At this point, you have phosphate groups on your 1 and your 6 carbon. So if you think about those as kind of being equivalent, that helps you remember that what happens is you split this up you get this dihydroxyacetone phosphate. I'll put it over here just so it matches the diagram. You get this dihydroxyacetone phosphate where the phosphate group is on the one position and the glyceraldehyde three phosphate where it's on the six position, which in this case is now the same as the three position. 
What's gonna happen though is that, I mean like the three, third position of pyruvate dehydrogenase, but that corresponds to the sixth position of glucose or the one position of glucose. Because now what's going to happen is that this is going to get interconverted with triose phosphate isomerase. And so it's not just flipping the molecule over, it's actually rearranging things and stuff. But what ends up is you're gonna get two molecules of glyceraldehyde three phosphate. So the phosphate group is going to be on the third position of, this, of the glyceraldehyde, but that was the one or the sixth position from your glucose. So if we think about our pyruvate um, that we have, we're going to have that the one or the sixth position is kind of be on the bottom. And then we have our two and our five, which are equivalent, and our three and our four, which are equivalent. And this is then going to be what's coming in. So when you make acetyl-CoA, it's actually going to be this carbon, so it was the first of our acetyl-CoA, but it's corresponding to the third or the fourth of our um, glucose. So we're losing the 3,4 from that original glucose. So imagine that we're basically going to lose the 3 and the 4 at this step. And that's going to give us our acetyl-CoA. Um, and so we'd have the 1 or the 6, the 2 and the 5. Just so I can um, leave this here, let's just leave turn this again that gets split like that we make our acetyl coa and now let's imagine we're just going to um take these through the pathway we'll take one of the one twos um but remember it's the same as the um the one is the same as the six and the two is the same as the five if we imagine now taking this into the citric acid cycle what's going to happen is remember um so we basically scramble these up like that. Okay. So remember, we're going to lose that four or the three and have this. And the way that you lose it is kind of like this. So now we're going to have our one, two position come over here. We lose this one. We lose this one. If we bring in another acetyl-CoA, we can imagine that now, oh, sorry, we rearrange that. We lose our two. We lose that, which was there already. We bring in another. Um, we lose that, we lose that, we lose that. So you can see that depending on whether you flip or not, it might take fewer or more cycles to actually get rid of it. Um, but so it'll take you like two or three cycles basically, or if you're really unlucky and keep flipping, it'll be weird. Um, but you'll finally get rid of that. And so we lost our two and then we lost our one. We would have also lost our five and then lost our six. At the end of the day though, we lost our one and our two and our five and our six from the citric acid cycle. We lost the three and the four from our pyruvate dehydrogenase step. If we were to say, instead of taking it from pyruvate dehydrogenase, we were to go and we were to make our pyruvate, so make our pyruvate, and then we were to take it to lactate, well, in that case, we're actually not going to lose any CO2. And the reason why I bring this up is because it's gonna come into play when we think about what if we are radio labeling things. But taking things to lactate does not make CO2, but it does allow us to regenerate our NAD plus if we wanted to keep glycolysis going. Let's imagine another way that we could take glucose. We could take it through the pentose phosphate pathway. If we take it through the pentose phosphate pathway, we are going to lose another CO2, but which one are we going to lose? When we go through the pentose phosphate pathway, what we're actually going to lose is we're going to lose this first glucose. So one of these, the first glucose is going to release the CO2, and then we're left with our ribose 5-phosphate. In this ribose 5-phosphate, basically we haven't lost We've lost the first position, but we haven't lost any other positions. We've only released that one CO2. So in the pentose phosphate pathway, we lost the first carbon. We also saw another place where we lost the first carbon, and that was our citric acid cycle. There we lost both the first carbon and the sixth carbon, whereas here we only lost the first carbon. What if we wanted to know about activity through the pentose phosphate pathway? Well, if we were to say radioactively label the one position, we'd see that we'd get it released, we get radioactive CO2 released. If we had flux or basic activity through the pentose phosphate pathway, we'd see that the one, if we had one labeled glucose, we'd see radioactively labeled CO2. 
But that wouldn't just tell us about the pentose phosphate pathway, that would also tell us about the citric acid cycle. What if we wanted to know about just the pentose phosphate pathway? Well, if we basically labeled um, the one position, we labeled the sixth position, here that wouldn't tell us about the pentose phosphate pathway, it would tell us about the citric acid cycle, um, and, but it wouldn't tell us about the pentose phosphate pathway. Therefore, if we wanted to know the activity through the pentose phosphate pathway, well, here we can compare the activity, the radioactivity we see from the citric acid cycle or from the when it was labeled at the sixth position to what we see when it was labeled at the one position. And that would tell us kind of like the difference would tell us about our activity through the pentose phosphate pathway. So if we take all of the CO2 that we measure, we see, okay, well, some of it is going to be coming from the citric acid cycle. Um, that's going to be We'll know about that from when we have it labeled at the sixth position, and then we'll know about the pentose phosphate pathway when we have it labeled at the one position. But when we have it labeled at the one position, that's also going to have some activity from the citric acid cycle, which is why we need both in order to know what's going on. If we think about that over here, we imagine that we have our glucose labeled at the first position. Here, if we have the glucose labeled at the first position, which is indicated with this like 14C, saying it's 14 carbon, so like radioactive carbon 14 at the first position. We see that we would get it released from the citric acid cycle, and we'll also see that it gets released by the pentose phosphate pathway. If we look at the sixth position, well here we see that it gets um, from the TCA, but not from the pentose phosphate pathway. So by comparing these two, we're able to tell about activity through the pentose phosphate pathway. If we wanted to know about activity through pyruvate dehydrogenase, here we'd want to label the third and the fourth position. That's only going to tell us about the, um, the flow through pyruvate. So basically, you're going to get uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase, so you get two per glucose. But you wouldn't, it wouldn't tell you anything about the TCA or the pentose phosphate pathway. If you were to label all the carbons, you would get radioactively labeled CO2 from each of these, but it'll get different amounts. You'll get two from pyruvate dehydrogenase, four from the citric acid cycle, and you would only get one from your pentose phosphate pathway. If instead you were to take that pyruvate dehydrogenase and make lactate, you wouldn't even see any CO2 released, and so that wouldn't, um, you'd have to actually measure the lactate itself if you wanted to know about that.